This is the Real Christian Manliness Podcast with Isaac and Tim Ingram. Let's get manly. Hello and welcome back to Lesson 9 of our Continue Discipleship Curriculum. And I am looking forward today to talking about the local church and the role of the local church in your life. We are on page 179 of your textbook. And again, I encourage you, if you don't have the book, to pull that out, get that open up, open up your Bible and be ready to look up some of these passages with me. Uh, This lesson is very important for several reasons as we look at uh, how the Bible describes the local church, the role of the local church in my life. But also as we look at some of the core beliefs that uh, form our faith as Baptists, and, and uh, we'll go through the Baptist distinctives, some of the things that uh, distinguish us from other uh, forms of Christianity and so forth. Um, but today in particular, we're going to see that the church is precious, the church is distinct, and the church is vital in our lives. And so as we begin now, uh, let's, let's dive right into Lesson 9. One of the best parts of the Christian life is being part of the local church. The church is an institution that Christ established himself, and it is his vehicle for bringing in the gospel to all the world. You get to be a part of it. The word church uh, means, and it can mean, I guess, wildly different things to different people. So it's important to understand what the Bible says about the local church. And in this lesson, we'll see its importance uh, of what the church actually is and how God uses the church in our lives. First of all, we see that the church is precious. Christ loved the church so much that he gave himself for it. We see this in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. The Bible says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Uh, So church attendance doesn't necessarily save us. It doesn't, you know, uh, get us to heaven. But the church is very important to God, and it is a, a vital aspect of Christian growth. So let's look at how the church is precious. Well, the church, first of all, was called out by Christ. Christ called out the church. Uh, To trace the beginning of the church, we need only to revisit the early moments of the ministry of Christ. For the church began with Jesus, and we see the first assembly forming as Jesus called his disciples. Let's look at Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 18. We see as Jesus begins to call together Uh, these disciples. The Bible says, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw two brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing all manner of sickness and all manner of diseases among people. So Christ began in his early ministry to call out those uh, disciples who would make up the first assembly, the first congregation of believers. We, We see, secondly, that Christ purchased the church. No church belongs to a pastor or a priest or a person. We we may talk about my church in the sense that it's where I'm a member, but at the end of the day, the church belongs to Christ. Acts 20, 28, the Bible says that uh, these men, these overseers, they were given the oversight of the church to feed the flock of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Uh, The blood shed by Jesus was that which purchased his church to himself. The Bible tells us also in Colossians, as we'll see in in a moment, that Christ is the head of the church. We see then that Christ commissioned the church. Before ascending to heaven, uh, Christ gave specific instructions to the church to reach the world with the gospel. Matthew 28, 19, and 20, he says, um, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And he says, Then go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And so we have Jesus then commissioning his church to go out and to teach the gospel uh, in, in, in all of the world. We see then that Christ must have preeminence in the church. Although the church meets 
uh, many needs in a Christian's life. We'll, we'll see these in later lessons. The church does not exist for us. Ultimately, it exists to glorify Christ. He is to have first place. Uh, Colossians 1.18, once again, as I mentioned, Christ is the head of the body, the church, the firstborn of the dead. So the church isn't man's idea. It's not an optional part. That's something we've just kind of come up with now that uh, and, and enforce on people. No, church was God's idea. When a Christian says that they can worship God independently of the local church, they are disregarding God's love for and emphasis on the church. When they love and commit to the local church, they are showing their love and commitment for that which is precious to Christ. So the church is precious. We see then also that the church is distinct. The church is more than just a building. It's a place where Christians meet together to grow in God's word, to glorify God, and to build lasting friendships with other Christians. It's not simply the universal body of saved people, uh, but rather it is comprised of local assemblies of people who agree on their faith and agree on the word of God, and they assemble together for the purpose of worship and the carrying out of the ordinances. So throughout the New Testament, emphasis is placed on the local church, individual bodies of believers who gather together as a church to follow the New Testament patterns of church and church practices. Uh, the book of Acts tells us that the first church like this was in Jerusalem. Uh, Acts 2.47, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Uh, and then it describes how the churches were established in other cities as the gospel spread. Uh, Acts 9.31, then there were churches, uh, then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord, and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, were multiplied. So we see the presence of multiple churches, not just the emphasis on, on a singular body of believers. Uh, 1541, and he went through Syria and Sicilia, confirming the churches, and so were the churches established in the faith and increased in numbers daily. The next nine New Testament books after Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, and then also 1 and 2 Thessalonians, these were all letters written by the Apostle Paul to local churches. Uh, we see in 1 Corinthians 1, 2, this type of a greeting, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them uh, that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. So the three epistles then following these ones that I've just mentioned, uh, First, Second Timothy and Titus, these are letters written to local church leaders. So 12 of the New Testament epistles specifically deal with the organization and operation um, and relationships within the local church. So just what is a local church and how is it structured. Well, the local church is a called out assembly. Jesus first announced his church in Matthew 16 when he told Peter, "Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it." Uh, we can read this passage in Matthew chapter 16 verses 13 through 18. Although some people have taught that Jesus in this passage was making Peter the first pope, uh, reading in the surrounding verses shows that Jesus said upon this rock, when he said that, he was referring not to Peter, but rather to himself. He was referring to the declaration that Peter made that Jesus was indeed the Son of God, and that upon this truth, this rock, that Jesus is the Son of God, he would build his church. Jesus is the founding rock. He's the cornerstone. We see this throughout the Bible in passages such as Ephesians 2.20 and 1 Peter 2.6. So the word Jesus used for church in the Greek language is the word ekklesia. Uh, and it means a called out assembly. A local church is a group of people who are called out from the world in the sense that they have been identified with Christ and are joining together for the purpose of forming a church as described in the New Testament. So the local church is called out. We see, secondly, that the local church is patterned after New Testament churches. Although the New Testament, uh, sorry, throughout the New Testament church, we see the pattern for how the local church is organized, what it believes, and how it operates. And we're going to look at this um, by using the acrostic for the word Baptist. 
Although uh, there are local churches and other denominations, our church here at Lancaster is a, is a Baptist church uh, because as a whole, this list summarizes what Baptists believe and practice uh, for the church. These are our, what we would call Baptist distinctives. What sets a Baptist church apart from the others? Uh, we believe this list most accurately reflects the New Testament teaching uh, of the church. And so we're going to use this acrostic as we describe this today. We see, first of all, the letter B stands for biblical authority in all matters of faith and practice. We believe that the Bible is inspired and infallible and is the final authority for our faith and practice. It is from God's word that we understand and teach fundamental doctrines of our faith, as well as pattern our church polity or structure of governance. 2 Timothy 3.16, as we saw in one of our first lessons, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The letter A stands for autonomy, autonomy or self-governing power of the local church. Because Christ is the head of the church, we believe that every local church should be independent uh, of a hierarchical framework or outside governmental structure. We ought to be free as local churches to follow and obey the word of God uh, as, as it is written to us and as our final authority. Uh, we see again in Colossians 1.18 that Jesus is the head of the body of the church, that in all things he may have preeminence. Uh, Ephesians 1, 22, 23, and hath put all things under his feet and given him and gave him to be the head over all things in the church, which is the body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Uh, so Jesus is the only head of the church, the local pastor, his under shepherd. Uh, and so every church is self-governing. The letter P stands for priesthood of believers, a hallmark belief um, that sparked the Protestant Reformation and other developments in, in the church during that time frame. God's word assures that every believer has direct access to God through our relationship with Christ. 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all, to be testified in due time. So every Christian has the uh, mediator of Jesus Christ between him and God. He does not go to a priest for uh, to confess or as a mediator. Uh, there's no other person uh, or pastor on this earth that mediates between man and God. God has uh, man has direct access to God through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are two offices. The letter T two offices within the church. Scripture only mentions two church offices. A pastor, also referred to as an elder or bishop, someone who is an overseer, and a deacon. Uh, these two offices are to be filled by godly men of integrity uh, in each local church. Scripture gives specific qualifications for these offices. We see this Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul and Timotheus, a servant of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus which are at Philippi, with the bishops, and the deacons. So two offices, the office of overseer, pastor, uh, or the office of the deacon. The letter I, then we have B-A-P-T, the letter I, individual soul liberty. We believe that each person must make a personal decision of repentance and faith in Christ. Parents do not make this decision for children. The government cannot make it for its people. Additionally, each person is responsible before God in matters of holiness and conscience. Uh, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Uh, again, a child or an infant cannot be baptized and become a Christian in terms of being saved uh, because that child has personal soul liberty and personal soul responsibility to place their faith in Christ individually. The letter S stands for separation of church and state. Although Christians w should be law-abiding citizens, the state should never have power to create a state religion or to intervene in the free expression of religious liberty. Uh, Acts 5, 29-31, Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be the prince and the savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. The next letter T stands for two ordinances, baptism and the Lord's table. 
These are ordinances, not sacraments. They are not uh, places where grace is extended or um, imparted upon those who partake. Rather, they are ceremonies. They are rituals. Um, at least the Lord's table is a ritual. Baptism being, of course, a ritual signifying an outward testimony of someone's inward faith. Matthew twenty-eight nineteen says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. So we looked at baptism at length in lesson four, so we don't we won't review it here. But let's understand the Lord's table for just a moment. Something that we've sometimes called communion, referring to the closeness of our relationship to the Lord. Jesus himself instituted the Lord's table the night before he was crucified. He instructs us to regularly observe it as a church, um, taking time to remember his sacrifice for us and to examine our lives for sin that would hinder our fellowship with him. So once again, the Lord's table is type of a, of a ritual that we uh, do as a community of believers specifically to call to remembrance the sacrifice of Christ, what he's done for us, causing us also to examine ourselves. You know, is there anything in my life right now that in which, in which area I'm not walking worthy of Christ and uh, anything that I need to uh, give up or sacrifice or, or, or put off um, in remembrance of Jesus and what he's done for me? And it also uh, reminds us of the bond that we have as a community of believers. Uh, in that moment, there may be times of... Um, you know, where uh, there's an offense and, and there's a, a brother that has sinned against me or maybe a, a, a lack of forgiveness, well, it's an opportunity for me to recognize that and to stop and, and say, okay, I need to take care of this. I need to remember what connects us, what unites us more than these things that would divide us. First Corinthians eleven twenty three really gives us a Paul's instruction for the Lord's table. It says, For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, he also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he comes. So, two ordinances, baptism and the Lord's table. Finally, then, we have uh, separation and personal holiness. We believe that Christ's ultimate sacrifice demands our complete consecration, and we desire that our living, our daily living, would reflect the holiness of our great God. Uh, we believe that members of the church should live a life that is distinct from the world. Second Corinthians 6.14, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? First Peter 1.16, Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. As we talk about separation, it's, it's important that we recognize the fact that, yes, uh, there are many areas in which there is not explicit command in the Bible about one thing or another. And we understand that. And sometimes when we speak about separation as a local church, it can, it can sometimes cause just different reactions from different people. And I think what's important that we walk away with is that the Bible does call for distinction. The Bible calls that we would be separate, that we would be set apart, that there would be something distinctly different about us, whether it's in the way, uh, it, whether it's in our modesty or if it's in our worship, the way that we passionately praise and 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 celebrate our Savior. Certainly in our conversation, in our talk, in our lifestyle, the way we raise our children, the way that we live every single day, uh, our love, our community involvement, all these things ought to be distinctly different, distinctly selfless, and distinctly. Um, characteristic of Jesus Christ. So uh, it's always possible to get caught up with specific things of separation and, and you don't like this rule or you don't like that standard or you wish that this was different. And you know, uh, we're never going to be perfect, but I definitely want to be on the side of, of intentionally trying to be distinct, intentionally allowing Christ to guide and the Holy Spirit to guide me in these matters rather than to be one who just simply box at separation. Um, I need to have standards, I need to have convictions, I need to live by those convictions, and I need to allow the Holy Spirit to guide me. That's why I really believe in Ephesians 5 when it tells us, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Just a few verses before that, the Bible says, see then that ye walk circumspectly. 
So whether or not we're, you would advocate one aspect of separation or another, God's word clearly commands that we walk circumspectly, that we walk with uh, attention to all areas of our life. There's no area of our life where we ought not to consider and ask the question, is this honoring to Christ? Is this distinctive of my faith? Separation of personal holiness. These eight beliefs, the Bible authority, the autonomy of the local church, priesthood of the believer, two offices, uh, or officers within the church, the pastor and the deacons, uh, individual soul liberty, separation of church and state, two ordinances, baptism in the Lord's table, and separation of personal holiness. These are the basic teachings and practices of the New Testament church. The church is not an organization as much as it is an organism, a living, functioning body of believers who are saved, baptized, and organized to fulfill the New Testament instructions for the church. So the church is distinct. And then we see finally that the church is vital. Uh, you, you listen to these things, you're like, okay, well, that's, that's all fine and dandy. But for me right now in my life, what is the point? The church is not simply an add-on to the Christian life. It is an essential part of Christian growth. It is essential in God's plan for holding truth and for reaching the world with the gospel. So how is it vital? Well, first of all, it's the guardian of truth. If the church won't hold and stand for the truth, who will? And we see this clearly exemplified in scriptures. The church is the pillar and the ground of truth in 1 Timothy 3.15. But if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. Christians are also to contend for the faith. Jude 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Uh, so the church exists as a guardian of truth. We are to declare truth. We are to live truth. We are to guard against heresy and to guard against those who would practice the gospel falsely. But then the church is also God's plan to reach the world. God has commanded us to bring the gospel to the entire world, and the local church is the vehicle by which this takes place, through personal outreach, through worldwide missions, through being uh, the hands, the feet, the, the love of Christ in the community, uh, we, we reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, Matthew twenty eight nineteen twenty again, that we would go into all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. So it's a place to reach the world. It is also God's place to nurture the Christian. Notice these purposes for the local church that help you grow in your Christian walk. The church exists to preach the word of God. Bible preaching works in our hearts and it helps us to grow into spiritual maturity. As we saw in our previous lesson about your relationship, you need to be constantly hearing the word of God. And again, I'm just so amazed sometimes when you go to church and you and you listen to the preaching and you intently, you know, are following along and asking God to to speak to your heart and show you what you need to do. It's amazing how sometimes the preacher says something and you're, and you're sitting back thinking, OK, who told him that about me or how did he know? But you know what? That's exactly what preaching does. It accomplishes in our heart what only the Holy Spirit can do and only what he can know. Only he can put on the heart of the pastor what to say on a Sunday morning to be so effective in our lives to know exactly where we are and what we need and what we need to change. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So it, it preaches the word of God. The church exists to provide fellowship. Local church is a place where we can meet people who desire to serve the Lord and live for him. Look, there's plenty of people in the world and probably plenty of people even around you who don't love God, who don't care what the Bible says and have no desire to encourage you in your faith. You need to get around other people and fellowship with them and continue with them as they encourage you in your walk with Christ. And then we see that the church provides oversight. Christ is the head of the church, but he has designated the pastor as an under-shepherd who provides spiritual leadership. Your pastor is a gift given by God to encourage, edify, and equip your life for spiritual growth and fruitfulness. And a wise Christian will always establish a strong relationship with his pastor. Hebrews 13, 17 commands that we would, um, uh, that, well, you know what, let's look it up. Hebrews chapter 13. 
verse 17. The Bible says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they must give account that they do so with joy, not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. It's saying that it's it's unprofitable. It's not good for you that they would um, have the rule, the oversight um, over you, and that that would be something of a grievance to them because of walking unruly or or even not uh, listening, not being submissive, not being uh, encouraging of their oversight in your life. Then we see that the church exists to restore sinful members. The church is to be a place where we don't only receive grace and salvation, but also where we extend grace to those who have fallen into sin. We want to be restored to the fellowship with God and the church family. It's important. And the Bible says, ye that are spiritual, restore such a one. Um, it, it's often easily, easily our tendency to judge, to pass judgment, to criticize, to cast out those who have fallen in sin, when in reality we are all the equal recipients of God's grace and should be equal extenders of God's grace. Do we encourage sin? No. Do we allow sin? Of course not. Do we encourage there to be restoration and holy living in the church? Yes. And But we're always, our, I would say it this way, our default is always a default of grace. Always patience, always desiring to see restoration and reconciliation first. And the separation, the casting off, the, humili- the, the humiliating that sometimes goes on as the default is not expressive of the kind of grace that we have received. And I, we can look at so many passages in the scriptures to exemplify this. And then we see that the church exists to disciple new believers. And I, I, I believe I've said this from the very beginning even of this podcast, uh, that this type of a course and listening to this maybe on the road, this can't ever replace the local church in your life. Uh, and wherever you are, wherever you're hearing this, I hope it's encouraging. I hope you're growing. But I hope that it's encouraging you to look at and to seek out that place where you can serve Christ on a regular basis with the local body of believers. Um, Ephesians 4, 11, and 12 speaks about how he gave some apostles and some uh, uh, pastors and some uh, you know pastors and teachers. And, but then he says that the reason for that was for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. The oversight and the church leadership that we have exists to help train us to do the work of the ministry. And that's through discipleship. Then to mature new Christians. Christian growth doesn't stop after you accept Christ as your Savior. In fact, uh, it's just the beginning, as we saw in our last lesson. At church, we learn how to grow and how to be more like our Savior. The Bible says in Ephesians 4.15 that we would grow up in our faith. Then, of course, the church exists to bring glory to God. God deserves glory. He's worthy of our praise. When we gather together and we sing songs about His greatness, we ought to sing them passionately from our hearts. We ought to listen intently to His Word as He gives us instruction uh, each week through our pastor. We ought to serve each other out of a heart of love and, and acceptance, again, desiring to extend grace more than uh, judgment. Uh, the church is good for us, but it's ultimately its purpose, and, and the purpose of any area of our life is to bring God ultimately the, the glory. All of this and more is done um, and it's God's provision for your growth through the local church. It all takes place in the church. So it's no wonder that the scripture instructs us in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. It says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. The Bible encourages us that so much the more we would be exhorting one another into love and good works as we see the day of Christ approaching. So, uh, once again, he- Hebrews ten twenty five. just listen to this encouragement, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the matter some is, but exhorting one another, encouraging one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The local church might be one of the most vital aspects of your Christian life. So how can we apply the- these teachings to our lives? Well, first of all, decide to be faithful in your attendance. You're not a number on some flow chart. You're not a number on us uh, on a snapshot of attendance. You know, it's not about you being there to help make up a number that, that, you know, we can all be happy that there's this many people in church. No, you need church. Yes, the church needs you. The church needs servants and, and those who would be there and worship together. But ultimately, you need the church. 
Decide to be faithful. Decide to be accountable to leadership. Don't just go in and get out and not talk to anyone, not give anybody any entrance in your life. No, build a relationship with your pastor, with your Sunday school teacher, with whoever uh, a mature Christian in the church who can keep you accountable. And when, when you don't make it, he's the one texting you, calling you, saying, hey, we missed you, where were you? And encouraging you to be faithful along those uh, along those lines. Then decide to be committed in your involvement. More than just attending church, be involved. Uh, your What you get out of church will, all, will ultimately, um, let me say it this way, what you get out of church will depend really on what you give. The time that you give, the, the passion you put into it, the heart that you put into it, and the more you give, the more that you'll get out of church. There's no question about that. And we've seen it so many times, even in our own lives. And so be faithful, be accountable, be committed as you desire to be part of the local church. Your uh, memory verse this week, I'd encourage you to memorize Hebrews 10.25, uh, which we just read here at the end. And then continue reading through these uh, daily devotionals that are that are super helpful. The review of day five. Um, is always helpful in going over the lesson content. And then I look forward next week to talking about a very important lesson and a milestone, really, in this curriculum, Lesson 10, where we talk about your place in the church family, your spiritual gifts. Uh, and there is uh, typically a spiritual gift that is included with this lesson, uh, sorry, a spiritual gift test uh, that you can take and uh, try to uh, discern what the spiritual gifts God has given you and how you can use those in your local church. So I'll look forward to seeing you at Lesson 10. Thank you for listening to the Real Christian Manliness Podcast. We hope you enjoyed our show. Now, if you could do us a favor, go over to iTunes and leave us a five-star rating. That way, other people can find us easily in the rankings. And if for some reason you don't think we deserve five stars, give us whatever you think we deserve. But please explain why we got that rating in a review. Now make sure you subscribe and have a great day.